Well, good morning. It's still morning, and we are standing between you and lunch. But we're excited about this panel. Uh, and I must take a moment to express our, indeed, excitement and gratitude to APLU uh, and all of the planners and supporters of this celebration. Indeed, is it an important one? Uh, we're looking at the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act. We can think about the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And uh, both of those, each of those, are really critically important to my institution, Lincoln University. Indeed, Lincoln University was founded in 1866 by Civil War veterans, soldiers, uh, African American soldiers of the 62nd and 65th United States Colored Infantry Regiments who fought very bravely during the Civil War, even though they couldn't read. They, at the that time in the Civil War, African Americans in Missouri weren't allowed to learn to read. And so during the war, their officers taught them to read. They had many nights around the campfire, and they came back and established Lincoln University as their legacy of literacy for future generations of African Americans and writ large of all of the students that we now accept. We are indeed an open admissions institution and try very hard to make sure that our students are not just educated four years hence, but are well prepared for uh, responsible participation and indeed leadership. Um, we uh, are very grateful to the Morrill Act because in 1890 we did become an 1890 land grant institution and it had a profound and positive impact on the trajectory of our campus. And so today we still have that strong military co connection and a uh, very fine ROTC program, have done very, very, I think, um, uh, good research, uh, well-recognized and appreciated research that benefits the military. But we also have fine programs in uh, GOAT research. We take the lead in the state on that. Uh, we have urban outreach centers, our extension work both in St. Louis and in Kansas City and in Southeast Missouri. We have uh, very fine um, uh, aquaculture programs just completed the construction of a new aquaculture building and well, uh, a strong history of excellent international programs involvement. Uh, and I must take a moment to say that's largely vested in the person of Dr. Iqbal Chowdhury, who is our international programs director, has been at the campus for some 40 years. And this year, a couple of weeks ago, was awarded the 2012 AIARD Distinguished Service Award. So we're really very, very happy to be here and be part of this conference. Uh, I also uh, noticed that my friend President Milliken looked at me and smiled when Bill Gates was talking about mathematics and mathematics education reform. I am a mathematician, a product of a, a very fine land grant institution, the Ohio State University. Uh, and in 1984, when I received my degree, degree in mathematics, I was uh, only the 25th African-American female to do so in this country. And so I, I, I spent much of my career, professional career, in uh, mathematics and science education reform. And I'm therefore very excited about the panel we have today about engineering education and the sciences. Uh, I want now to turn to that and introduce the very fine speakers who, uh, whose remarks we will be privileged to enjoy. First, Charles Vest is the president of the National Academy of Engineering and president emeritus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Vest earned a BS in mechanical engineering from West Virginia University in 1963 and the MSE and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan in 1964 and 1967, respectively. He joined the faculty of the University of Michigan as an assistant professor in 1968, where he taught in the areas of heat transfer, thermodynamics, and fluid mechanics, and conducted research in heat transfer and engineering applications of laser optics and holography. He became an associate professor in 1972 and a full professor in 1977. In 1981, Dr. Vest turned much of his attention to academic administration at the University of Michigan, serving as Associate Dean of Engineering from 1981 to 86, 
dean of engineering from 86 to 89, and then he became provost and vice president for academic affairs. In 1990, he became president of MIT and served in that position until December 2004. He was director of DuPont for 14 years and of IBM for 13 years was vice chair of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness for eight years and served on various federal, federal committees and commissions, including the President's Committee on, of Advisors on Science and Technology, affectionately known as PCAST, during the Clinton and Budget Bush administrations. The Commission on the Intelligence Capabilities of the United States regarding Weapons of Mass Destruction, the Secretary of Education's Commission on the Future of Higher Education, the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Transformational Diplomacy, and the Rice Chertoff Secure Borders and Open Doors Advisory Committee. He serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations and foundations devoted to education, science, and technology. In July 2007, he was elected to serve as president of the U.S. National Academy of Engineers and he has received honorary doctoral degrees from 17 universities and was awarded the 2006 National Medal of Technology by President Bush and received the 2011 Vannevar Bush Award. Uh, and so we are delighted to have him uh, to speak to us. Uh, my, our second presenter is Sylvester James Gates. Jim Gates was junior, was born December 5, 1950, and is an American theoretical physicist. He received BS and PhD degrees from MIT, the latter in 1977. His doctoral thesis was the first thesis at MIT to deal with supersymmetry. Gates is currently the John S. Toll Professor of Physics at the University of Maryland, College Park, and serves on um, President Barack Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. He is known for his work on supersymmetry, supergravity, and superstring theory. In 1984, working with M.T. Grissery, M. Rukich, and W. Siegel, Gates co-authored Superspace, the first comprehensive book on the topic of supersymmetry. Gates has been featured extensively on many NOVA PBS programs on physics, most notably The Elegant Universe in 2003. In 2006, he completed a DVD series titled Superstring Theory, The DNA of Reality for the teaching company, composed of 24 half-hour lectures to make the complexities of unification theory comprehensible to lay people. During the 2008 World Science Festival, Professor Gates narrated a ballet, The Elegant Universe, where he gave a public presentation of the artistic forms connected to his scientific research. During his career, Dr. Grace Gates, I'm sorry, has received a number of honors for his teaching, including the 1990 College Science Teacher of the Year from the Washington Academy of Sciences, the 2002 Distinguished Scholar Teacher from the University of Maryland, and the 2003 Cop, uh, can't read my handwriting, Coptech Award from the American Association of Physics Teachers. In 2006, the AAAS honored him with the Public Understanding of Science Award. Dr. Gates is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Society for Science and the Public and the Board of Advisors for the Department of Energy's Fermi National Laboratory. And in October 2011, he was inducted into the National Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I'm delighted to have both of them and look forward to their remarks, which we'll hear now. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, Two or three years ago, our great filmmaker, Ken Burns, produced a PBS series called America's Best Idea. It was about our national parks. I love our national parks, but America's best idea are these great public research universities that dot the landscape from coast to coast. This is a critically important time for our nation to reflect on the amazing legacy of the Morrill Act 
and especially the opportunity that land grant and public universities have provided to young people into our country for 150 years. But it's even more important to look ahead. Despite the very dark economic clouds that cast shadows on our universities, I am confident that our nation will continue to sustain these great public universities and that they will continue to be able to provide opportunity to young men and women, to our cities, our states, our nation, and the world in this century, just as they have for the past 150 years. Why am I confident? I'm confident in the future because I believe what Winston Churchill famously said, which is, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> so this is an exciting, if scary, moment in our history. It's without question the most exciting time in human history to be doing science or technology or engineering. The globalization of everything, painful though it may be from time to time, is exciting and filled with opportunity. U.S. dominance in higher education is being challenged today. Seriously diminishing commitment to our public universities in this down economy is something we all must deal with. Short-term outlook and oversimplification in public and policy dialogue continues unabated. The dawning of the transformation of higher education by the kind of next generation interactive online learning that Bill Gates talked about is a bright spot on the horizon in my view. And there's the fundamental fact that what our universities do has never, never been needed more than it is today. So what are the big challenges, the big intellectual issues in engineering that lie ahead? Well, this is the question that was posed to me by Peter McPherson. But I have it made because the National Academy of Engineering about six years ago brought together an incredible group of innovators. We convened them to develop exactly this, a set of engineering grand challenges for the new century. This committee was truly remarkable. It was chaired by Bill Perry, our former Secretary of Defense, now professor at Stanford University. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it had people like Larry Page, one of the founders of Google, Dean Kamen, the uh, inventor of the Segway and many biomedical devices, Bob Langer, perhaps the best biomedical engineer uh, in the world, Jane Lubchenco, who is now heading NOAA here in Washington, Bernadine Healy, the former director of the National Institutes of Health, Mario Molina, who of course won the Nobel Prize for finding out what CFCs were doing to the ozone layer, and many other extraordinary men and women like this from around the nation and around the world. They came up with 14 challenges. These aren't supposed to be the challenges, but a set of 14 grand challenges that fit the two criteria we asked for. First, if they are successfully met, they will improve life on Earth. In fact, some of them are necessary to meet to continue to sustain human life on Earth, and secondly, that this group believed these were actually doable in a reasonable amount of time if we turn our intellect and resources to it. It included things like making solar energy affordable, managing the nitrogen cycle, providing access to clean water, restoring and improving urban infrastructure, reverse engineering the brain, and many other exciting things, uh, including advancing personalized learning, which again is very much what Bill Gates talked about today. But these fit, despite, uh, regardless of their details, they fit into four boxes. Those having to do with sustainability, energy, water, climate, etc. Those having to do with health, new ways of, pro of producing medicine, new uses of systems engineering and informatics to deliver healthcare in a more efficient and effective way, security against both natural threats and human-caused threats, and finally what this group surprisingly called joy of living, things that expand our abilities as human beings to do good, 
to learn, to build the tools of discovery for our basic scientists, and so forth. But let me take a little different cut. What are the technological frontiers today? I think there are two, and they are at the two extreme ends, as one might suspect. The tiny scale frontier, the work going on at the so-called bio-nano interface, uh, info interface, where really physical sciences and engineering work hand in hand and almost morph so much that they're not distinguishable from one another, where we actually work one atom at a time to construct new materials, devices, and ultimately systems. But equally important in my view is the large scale frontier. Increasingly large complex systems that have major societal consequences. These are the things that have engineering at their core that enable the continuing urbanization, the provision of uh, energy and water, and uh, the development of resilience against uh, natural and man-made threats and so forth. These large-scale issues in many ways have been somewhat ignored over the past half century, and I think we're going to see a rebirth of really exciting engineering research and development and innovation in these fields. And of course, all of this fits in the context of the emerging world of so-called big data, big computing, and the cloud that helps to bridge and empower work at both of these extreme frontiers. But despite, and despite the dangers of making predictions, I look especially to three areas to define much of the excitement and opportunity for engineering research and practice in the decades ahead. First, computing, not surprisingly. Now in the late 20th century, when most of us uh, did our, uh, much of our work, computing was primarily about the flow of information, the storage, transmission, and analysis of data, uh, via uh, information technology, the use of the internet, and of course the development and deployment and use of the World Wide Web. In at least the foreseeable part of the 21st century, I think computing will increasingly be more about generation of knowledge through modeling and simulation at extreme scales, and also knowledge sharing through distributed discovery, operation, and innovation. The second area I look to is coming to be known as convergence, which, which uh, implies the convergence of biology, physical science, and engineering. There is a lot of exciting future here, not only in what this is going to do for medicine through new kinds of institutions like the new Koch Center for integrative cancer research at MIT, the investigators uh, uh, within which are half biologists and half engineers, bringing new insights, new ways of thinking about biology and about medicine, but also the use of biology through this convergence as a new basis for designing and developing new materials, particularly things that will have a lower environmental impact. And the third area is what I like to call brain integration. This could be the topic of an hour, but it won't be. But I believe that we are seeing the dawning of an integration of people and computing power that can solve problems and meet challenges more successfully than either ever have or can do alone. But we also have a huge cultural and social challenge facing us in regard to our 21st century engineering workforce. Let me state it very simply. Today, almost 40% of our 18 to 23-year-old population in the United States are so-called minorities. Yet they comprise less than 17%, for example, of our engineering graduates. 60% plus of US college graduates today are women yet they comprise 1.3%. Only 1.3% of our women graduates are engineers. What a waste. So the decade ahead will be extremely exciting and productive ones in engineering and technology, 
and our remarkable system of public and land-grant universities will continue to provide opportunity to generations of young women and men to advance our economy, our health, our security, and the quality of life of our citizens of this nation and indeed citizens of the world. Thank you very much. It's always a great honor to follow Chuck. We've known each other for some number of years. But today I find that something has happened to me that has never happened before, and I get a chance to speak it to an audience following my 32nd cousin, Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> so I was um, asked to uh, give a perspective on a number of activities in which I've involved. I'm also, it turns out, a member of the Maryland State Board of Education, as well as my uh, policy obligations to the Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And then finally, I'm a parent like most of you. And uh, I have a set of twins who just finished their first year of college. And my uh, son is a biology major. And my daughter is a double major in math and physics. Wow. So we live STEM in my family. That's, <laughs> that's what I, where I want to start from. My wife turns out to be a medical doctor. And uh, although the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't seem to understand it, doctors increasingly are also STEM workers because there's an inculcation of uh, knowledge, IT technology into medicine going on now like, like you wouldn't believe. So what I really wanted to do was talk about a couple of things. Um, in, pre in preparing for this presentation, I decided to, to look back at uh, 1961 and 1962. And in particular, what our country did that decade in being the first nation to put a man on the moon. And uh, in particular, there are a couple of comments that come to us from John Kennedy that I think are very relevant and cogent uh, today. He says, or said, if we are to win the battle for what is now going on around the world, the dramatic achievements in space which occurred in the recent weeks should have made clear to us, as the Sputnik did in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of what road they should take. We live in such times now. The battles are not necessarily the types that are existential battles where we're talking about wars, but we are talking about what I like to call the reignition of the American dream. The American dream 2.0. That's, in fact, the battle for which we are engaged. Kennedy also said something else that I, I really uh, take to heart. He says, we, chose, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win, and the others too. There is in this comment the usual and traditional American can-do spirit. And as I look at my nation, and the trials that we are facing now, we can use that. We have got to be able to recover that American can-do spirit in terms of facing the challenges of the future. Now, we are here today, of course, to celebrate something quite remarkable, namely the uh, 1862 um, Morrill Act. And it was, in fact, remarkable. As alluded to in, in the introduction, this uh, was approved by uh, an act of Congress on July 2nd, 1862, our nation was engaged in a struggle, an existential struggle for its existence in that year. And yet, in the midst of trying to decide how we would proceed forward, in, forward into the future as a nation, we decided education was key. Now think about that. You're fighting for your survival, but at the same time, you are thinking about what must be invested so that there can be a future America that's better than the one in which those people live. And one of the key attributes was chosen to be education. This, to me, is a remarkable statement about the character of this nation over the last two centuries. 
that we have always, in fact, invested in education. In fact, uh, it turns out that somehow we know this is sort of in the genetic structure of this country as far as I can tell. Uh, in the middle 90s, I was a member of uh, a group that spoke on many college campuses, and I was amazed to find out how many colleges, not the esteemed institutions that you represent, the members of the APLU, but smaller colleges, colleges, growing colleges. Colleges are like biological creatures. They grow. And if you ask the question about how many of these colleges that have not quite reached the stage of maturity of your institutions, where do they come from? And you can hear the same story over and over again. Some wealthy businessman said, I want the kids in my community to have the same opportunities I had, and I'm going to invest in business to open that doorway. Or a church group, a church affiliated group says, we are going to open doors for our kids, and it's going to be done through education. And you cross this country, east coast to west, north to south, and go into small communities, and you will hear this story again, again, and again. It's in the genetic structure of our country to create institutions of the type which you all represent. Now, this struggle for education is, a, is one that, in my community, the African American community, it turns out that in 1845, the first struggle over school desegregation took place. It was fought, actually, in Boston. A young woman passed some examinations to admissions to uh, high school. She got the top grades on the exam, but she was refused admission because of her ethnicity. A whaling captain by the name of Absalom Boston decided he was going to fight for this young woman and filed a lawsuit. Since he was a whaling captain, in my mind, I always can see um, Gregory Peck. And, uh, <laughs> but since he was an African American, I know that couldn't quite be right. <laughs> But something like that, this captain fights for this young woman to be admitted to study. He wins the lawsuit, and that's in fact the first desegregation case I know about in this country. So all of us Americans have understood almost from the beginning of this nation's birth that education is a key, few, key to the future. So we today are in fact fighting a very long fight. And you know, people talk about the greatest generation. Well, we can be part of a greatest generation too, but our fight will be for this future America, this reignition of the American dream, and you all have a role to play in this. Let me turn to some of the efforts that we've been involved in at the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. We, in fact, have released two reports on education and science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the so-called STEM disciplines. The first report was released in October of 2010 and deals with how we might achieve a higher level of efficiency in the K through 12 part of our educational system. The report is, entired, is sorry, entitled Prepare to Inspire, and it deals with both of the main issues that we could find in studying the system for how we can, as a nation, get to a different place. Our second report, which was released this past January, is entitled Engage to Excel. And this report focused only on the first two years of post-secondary education. In fact, it is aimed squarely at this audience. Now, it turns out that if you do some studies, and I should tell you that PCAST, as, as was mentioned, PCAST is a, an amazing uh, organization, and, and I'm very proud to be a member and, um, Boy, it's just, a, uh, it's just remarkable the amount of energy and dedication that people put into to it. And as some of my colleagues like to point out, we, have, we earn this tremendous salary of zero dollars per hour. So in our recent report, Engage to Excel, we point some things out about how we might get college to a better place in STEM education, the post-secondary experience. The report gives five main recommendations. And we have a conceit in PCAS, I should admit to you. We like to think of our reports as not beautiful uh, shelf ornamentation, but instead as guidebooks. So for these five points I'm about to make, you can take them back to your faculties or your leadership and discuss them. Point number one, we should be able to teach better than we do because there's a science of learning out there. That is, there are, as uh, Bill Gates mentioned, we can now find metrics about what goes into good teaching. 
we can transform this faculty that's engaged in that teaching if we, uh, if we permit them the tools. So that's recommendation number one. Recommendation number two is even if you transform the faculty, and we've described some mechanisms for, for doing that, you have to change the environment in which they work. In fact, the transformation has also got to address the matter of the culture at the level of college and departments. And so, in fact, we've called for the um, Science Foundation and, that, and the Education Department to think about new grants structures that would allow this transformation. Point number three, there has got to be a national experiment in mathematics. Why? Um, mathematics turns out to be the key to this in some ways. And what we have found is that of the students who go to college, you can break them in, up into four groups. Those who are well prepared for math and want to major in STEM fields. Those who are not well prepared and want to major in STEM fields. Those are, are real super prepared in math but don't want to major in STEM fields. And those that do neither. <laughs> it turns out 14% falls in that first group. Well prepared, major in STEM fields. 13% fall in a group of not quite well prepared but interested in STEM fields. And so that's the challenge. Because if this group can figure out how to implement practice and policy so that we can stop the attrition in the first two years of college, we can meet the goal of having a, a million more STEM workers over a decade. And according to projections, that's the key to reigniting the American dream. Thank you. Well, I certainly want to thank you both. Uh, I think for your somewhat comprehensive but also inspiring remarks. Uh, and we will take questions, I'm given to understand, so if the persons with the microphones can get ready, uh, I will start. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, you heard me say something about being involved in mathematics and science education reform for many years, and it's really hard work. Uh, you talked about, each of you, things that we might want to do over the next decade or so to uh, get where we need to be. Uh, and, and one of you even talked about Sputnik and, and how the country was galvanized at that time toward educational reform. Is there a Sputnik moment uh, now that, that will inspire us to, to make the necessary changes? You know, let me take the first crack. I hope we don't get in a fight. <laughs> um, I'm a child of the Sputnik era, pure and simple. I'm a space cadet at heart. I still find these remarkable uh, comments by uh, President Kennedy to inspire me as much in 2012 as he did then. But let's stop waiting for Sputnik. <laughs> this generation, this generation has its own challenges. They don't need gray-haired guys like me telling them about how it was during Sputnik. What we find when we ask uh, young uh, men and women, and frankly, especially girls, w who fall into your category, they're really well prepared, but they choose not to go into a STEM field, why they didn't? The answer is almost always because I wanted to go into some field where I could help people and make the world better. It shows how lousy we have been at explaining what our fields in, in science and engineering uh, enable people to do. So I'm of a school that says, let's focus on today's challenges, these things we see out there in the future of the world with nine billion people and a climate that's being disrupted and all these things. That's even better than Sputnik as far as I'm concerned, but we, all of us, have to do a better job of explaining and, and, and inspiring kids. So the Sputnik moment, thank you. Yes, I agree. The Sputnik moment, then, is not something like a specific thing in your mind. It's the collective sort of inspiration that we need to provide for our youngsters. Yes, ma'am. Okay. May I? Um, we don't need a Sputnik moment. We need a Lady Gaga moment. Ha <laughs> ha, I love it. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you are music fans, but Lady Gaga is this incredible young woman who sings. She has a very uh, interesting and commercial style. But if you get behind her commercial style, you'll find out she's massively talented as a musician. And so, in fact, it goes back to something we often say about STEM disciplines, that it all proceeds from our expertise. And so what we really need is to be able to tell the young generation that you can be like Lady Gaga and help the world. And that speaks to, to what Chuck was saying about the attitude you often find among the young. 
terrific. I, I don't know where the mics are. I, I have good. OK, so please go ahead. Sabina O'Hara, Dean of the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability and Environmental Sciences of the University of the District of Columbia. Um, I was interested in hearing about the um, new institute of biology and engineering. And of course, there are a number of those that have cropped up, uh, biomimicry and other fields of that sort that have come out of that. Um, and that is certainly a step in the right direction in terms of interdisciplinarity and applied research and so forth. But it seems to me there is a absolutely critical piece missing. And thank you for your reference to the Lady Gaga moment because I think it, it sort of alludes to that. It seems to me that we really have the science and we've known the science for a long time or at least a good while. And while there continues to be a great need for advancing research in science and for improving our knowledge, where it's really at, it seems to me, is human behavior. Because so much of what we know, we don't seem to act on. And so I'm wondering, where is the integration of the social sciences? I'm speaking as a social scientist, I confess. Thank you. Well, Chuck said I should take the easy ones. <laughs> So let me make an attempt. Um, that's a very good question. It's something that many of us spend lots of time thinking about. In fact, in this recent report, Engage to Excel, that I alluded to, uh, in its formative period, we sought out advice from social scientists. I have to tell you, however, that we didn't get uh, engagement from that side, which we found very interesting because as you mentioned, and in fact, as Chuck mentioned, I think as all of us are kind of aware, we're really dealing with issues of culture at this point. Chuck said he's a, a space cadet. I was too. I mean, the part, reason I'm a, I was a scientist was I saw a movie in, in 1954 called Spaceways. First time I had ever seen a space launch, a countdown, an astronaut in a space suit. I was excited. I came home as a four-year-old telling my father about it. And there's a direct path from that movie that I saw in St. John's, Newfoundland, to my being here. So it was easy for our generation to become scientists. Our society was super saturated with giving the message, do science, do something good for the country. We've lost a lot of that. So the culture issues about how to engage the public now, we are certainly not the experts on that. We don't spend our lives studying the interactions of societies and cultures, but the social scientists do. But yet, as I said, we were not able to engage them. And it's something that I think that we scientists, those of us in STEM, are going to have to repeatedly make the appeal that we need your help. You've got to be able to help us on this one. Let me take just a, a slightly uh, different slice of this. Uh, when, when I spoke from an engineering perspective about the tiny systems frontier and the macroscopic large scale systems frontier, I mentioned that at this work in nanotechnology and so forth at that level that natural sciences and engineering just simply work together. They pretty much blend. What I didn't say, because somebody was holding up a sign that said one minute, uh, is that on this large scale systems, I believe that starting with education, we need to do a similar blending of social science and engineering and technology because none of these big systems of energy, water, climate, urban resilience, all these, none of these get done just by engineering. You can't do them without engineering, but you have to have engagement of people who understand politics, culture, management, economics, and so forth. And this has given rise uh, around the country and indeed around the world to sort of a small but very important educational movement uh, around what we call uh, engineering systems, which is different than systems engineering, but let me not bore you with that. But it's about these sort of socially relevant, large, complex uh, uh, undertakings with engineering at their core, but we've got to have the same kind of relation there, I believe, with the social sciences that we have with the natural sciences at the other end of the spectrum. Well, thank you. Uh, very quickly, that's just the last question. 
Yes, hi, uh, my name is uh, Adel Shir Mohammadi. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland, Associate Dean for College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, over the years that I have taught and mentored students, uh, and I have seen other colleagues and so forth, and talked with uh, throughout the country in our national uh, professional society meetings and so forth, uh, the challenges that I hear both from Sir Gates and uh, and also his 32nd cousin, uh, Dr. Gates here, uh, my colleague at the university, and, and that is um, the challenged group that we are talking about. In other words, those that are in the middle and they, whether they go into STEM fields and, and so forth. Um, I was wondering, actually, I couldn't get a chance to ask this question from uh, Mr. Gates as well, and that is, uh, are we in our rewarding system, are we sort of culturally have turned into elitism? And also in our uh, teaching sort of it is much easier I have found out to mentor and teach good students the challenge comes when the students who are being challenged and they are challenged in their own whether the environment whether whatever it has caused poor background and so forth I don't know if you have seen the movie called stand and deliver how the teacher basically nurtures uh, students from poor section and they go win the state and, and, and national uh, competition so I'm just basically thinking as an educator, where have we failed? How, back, how can we change our strategies to be able to help the, the challenge the students, those who, are, uh, who we need to pay more attention in terms of even rewarding uh, support, financial support, as well as really paying attention to the, uh, the teaching methods and so forth. Yeah, let, let me make a, a very quick comment, and then I suspect Jim has more profound things to say on this topic because he's been working on it recently very hard. Uh, the, the one thing I want to kind of challenge your perspective just a little bit, what uh, Jaime Escalante was doing that is celebrated in that movie was pursuing excellence. So don't begin this kind of a discussion by talking about, you know, are we getting too elite. Uh, America should be about elitism, but it should not be about a financial or inherited elitism, it's an earned one. So uh, what Jaime Escalante told us was, you gotta believe in kids, everybody's capable of learning. And I would agree very much, however, with your thesis that we sometimes do get so wrapped up in various aspects of our, our job and, and, uh, and finite time and finite resources that we don't make as much of a core value of believing and building on the fact that everybody can learn. I, I think we've got a shift and change in a lot of ways in that regard. And um, Chuck, you've actually hit the nail right on the head. Uh, uh, in a forum very similar to this, I was asked a similar question, and I, and I pointed out that, you know, it, it, the United States has the most effective military in the world. Uh, that, go, that stands sort of without any sort of conflict. But if you look at the ethos, the culture of the military, one of the things that you find that they have built into the culture is we will not leave our people behind. It turns out this is true in medical school too. And so there are parts of the uh, educational uh, establishment that understand that a belief that in the people who are coming to the institution, that that belief and then acting on that belief is a key lever for increasing one's effectiveness. And again, since you are all leaders at large institutions, this is a change for a culture for us especially in the STEM fields, where for so long, it was, it, you know, there's this concept of the weed out course, right? The whole purpose of the course was to weed people out. Well, we've weeded so much out that there's nothing now to grow in the garden. So we have got to figure out how to plant, how to cultivate, and how to raise this new generation of Americans. And one thing that is really interesting to me about the question that was asked and Chuck's response is that our report, Engage to Excel, is in fact aimed at the group that you're talking about. We point out that you can debate whether we have enough scientists, and this is a debate in engineers at the elite levels. This is a debate that's been going on for about a decade. But there's pretty clear evidence that we do not have enough STEM-capable workers. What's a STEM-capable worker? Well, that's someone who has the skill set that a STEM education would give them, but are out in the real world because you know the, uh, the academy where you and I reside is the unreal world, it's the imaginary access to a lot of people. But out in the real world, there are people who apply these skills. And one example, for example, I tell people, everyone should know what um, 
what computer numerical controls mean. I don't know how many policymakers know that phrase, C and C. But it's the way that modern manufacturing is going to occur. It'll involve humans interfacing with computers to manufacture products. It turns out that even though we have upward of 14 million Americans who can't find jobs in this country, there are several hundred thousand jobs in this country that can't find Americans to take them because they don't have the skill sets. And a lot of these are these STEM capable workers. And so it is indeed towards this middle group that the country needs desperately if we're going to reignite the American dream. And we as institutions have got to understand that and make the appropriate adjustments in our culture to reach this higher level of proficiency. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's how we <laughs>